democracy are strong, then the people of the country have very little to fear from military commanders speaking out on political issues. Whether their speech is repugnant or helpful, there's very little fear, assuming you can put a quality on it. When the institutions of a republic are weak, such as more in the case of Weimar Germany, there's something to fear about both um, senior military officers being active, but also senior military officers being complicitly um, inactive. And uh, France also presents us, and I won't steal any of Professor Nyberg's um, topic on this, France also presents us with uh, interesting and important historic example to think of. I will say this for both Professor Schneid and Professor Nyberg's topics. PhD theses are written on them and books are written on them and historians in French and German history will spend their lives debating these fundamental issues. And we're going to try to boil it down to 25 minutes a piece, which as I've told uh, my students, when you're doing a closing argument in a, as a prosecutor or defense counsel, that's appropriate. I'm not sure it will be um, here because of the complexity, but without further ado, away we go. So for those of us who saw the first week of June on the news, this is what we know. There have been mass demonstrations across the United States depend, uh, demanding um, social justice, police reform, in some instances, abolishment of the police. The, the demonstrations have um, centered around the concept of, of Black Lives Matter uh, and um, in, in the realm of social justice. President Trump um, had on a number of occasions referred to the largely peaceful protests and there have been some acts of violence, but largely peaceful protests uh, by commenting that and accusing them of being infested with this so-called Antifa and other leftist causes. When he moved to go to make a photo opportunity at a church, um, he threatened the use of military force uh, and what he would claim in concert with the Insurrection Act. Uh, almost immediately, a number of prominent retired military officers, senior military officers, including Colin Powell, um, James Mattis, who had served as Secretary of Defense, Admiral Mullen, the former Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and Admiral McRaven, the former Navy SEALs commander, among others, denounced the President for doing this. And this is a truly extraordinary event in our history because I can only think of one other time in history where this event has happened. And that is with the assumption of Abraham Lincoln to the presidency, I'm drawing no comparison between 1861 and the present, but with the assumption of Abraham Lincoln to the presidency, a number of generals and retired generals um, spoke out. Now, why is this important? It's important for a number of reasons, namely, the military is subservient to the elected civil government under the constitution. It follows the orders of the commander in chief and civilians and military officers, including myself who've retired are not free from the military. In fact, for the remainder of my life, I and the generals who spoke out remain subject to court martial jurisdiction within 10 US code 802. This jurisdictional construct is based on the idea that once you're in receipt of retirement pay, you're not really getting retirement pay, you're getting retainer pay so that in the uh, potential national emergency, you can be recalled to active duty. That happened in Vietnam. Uh, it happened in World War II and World War I. It happened during the Civil War. And occasionally it happens because there are shortages of pilots and the like. I don't, there never shortages of lawyers um, in the military, but this has been tested in the courts. Um, one is you may see the newspaper clipping on the bottom right hand side of the screen, uh, the arrest of Captain Arms. Captain Arms had been retired for 20 years and for some reason he wrote a disparaging letter to President William McKinley and to General Schofield, the uh, uh, commanding general of the United States Army on Schofield's last name. Uh, last day in, in office before he retired, Arms was recalled to active duty, arrested in court martial in the Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, upheld that. There's a more unfortunate case that uh, deserves a posthumous pardon, in my own opinion, and that's the trial of Admiral Selden Hooper. 
Admiral Hooper was a highly decorated naval officer in World War II, a destroyer commander who served alongside of Admiral Halsey um, and protected the fleet. Uh, he retired shortly after World War II and he was caught in a San Diego police sting operation that was attempting to ensnare gay males. Uh, Admiral Hooper was taken off of retirement, court-martialed, and convicted for conduct on becoming an officer and gentleman. He lost his retirement and he spent the rest of his life over a three decade long period of time fighting a losing battle in the courts to get his retirement pay back. The Hooper case um, and, and the uh, Clausen case, which is really the arms case, you can find them online and I can certainly send those out to you. The United States Supreme Court clarified what military retirement is as early as 1880, and that is we're never really retired, and that's why we get retirement pay. Now, why does this matter? Well, of course it matters because Colin Powell, in theory, could be recalled to active duty and court-martialed, but it matters for another reason. When our country was founded, one of the overriding features of our constitution was fears of a standing army. And I don't mean the state national guards or their predecessors, the militia, I just mean a standing army. Most of the founding um, fathers, as it were, the framers of the constitution didn't even want an army. They struck a compromise with Alexander Hamilton, the one person who seemed to want one. They inherited their fears of a standing army from the British Whigs. They wrote them into the United States Constitution. You can see this in the Federalist number 41. You can see in the plain text of the Constitution. The army is only good for two years to this day. Congress has to appropriate it. If they don't, it ceases to exist. Uh, Congress rather than the president makes rules for the government and regulation of the land and naval forces. That's the UCMJ. It's Congress that makes the rules, not the president. And it also tells the president when the president can call the guard and its predecessor, the militia out to suppress an insurrection. Note that didn't happen with President Trump's threat. Congress was largely silent on that feature. One final point before turning it over to Professor Nyberg is this. While there's been a reticence for politicians, for, for generals to become in, and admirals to become in politicians, the following people have run for office while still in uniform. Now, I don't include Andrew Jackson or William Henry Harrison in this because they weren't professional generals. Jackson may have thought he was, but he was a justice on the Tennessee Supreme Court and a senator uh, before he donned the uniform again. But Zachary Taylor ran in office, and of course, Ulysses Grant ran for office in uniform. Um, and Dwight Eisenhower resigned after he accepted the Republican nomination. And many of them, have, many have tried. Uh, Winfield Scott Hancock, Winfield Scott ran in uniform. Douglas MacArthur wanted to get the Republican nomination in 1952 as a compromise candidate between Robert Taft and Dwight Eisenhower. He flopped miserably in that. Leonard Wood, those of us who are our, my age and older might remember Al Haig trying to become president in 1988, not getting very far. And of course, General Wesley Clark. And I've left one for last, and that's George McClellan. George McClellan ran against Abraham Lincoln in 1864 in uniform and did not resign until after the election. And he embraced the, the Democratic Party platform, which called the war a failure. He promised, uh, or at least agreed, that uh, reconciliation with the South and the continuation of slavery was the price of, of ending the war would be fine. And he accused Lincoln of treason to the Constitution. That's pretty damning words in wartime. Now, that brings me to one last point. Article 88 of the UCMJ applies to Colin Powell and others. Um, and that is, when you're an officer in the United States military, you cannot use contemptuous words against the president, the vice president, Congress as a whole, the secretary of defense, uh, the secretaries of the military departments and, and others. You may see the symbols on the side. There's a Supreme Court case on this point. Uh, all of you have had constitutional law or constitutional rights are probably somewhat familiar with Parker versus Levy. Captain Levy accused Lyndon Johnson of being a war criminal. 
and he he was training medics to go to Vietnam. He was a he's a doctor. I think he's still alive. Um, and he would tell his enlisted students the war was a, the war was immoral and they shouldn't go. And for that, he was court-martialed and sent to Fort Leavenworth after being convicted. And he's not the only one who did that. And yet, most of the time when retirees get become involved in politics and quite frankly say contemptuous words against the president, they're either given a pass or they're ignored. So here is Richard Pearson Hop, uh, Richard Pearson Hobson, one of the architects of prohibition. And we're in the 100th anniversary now of the first year of the 18th Amendment and the Volstead Act. And he was partly responsible for it. He was also a retired admiral from the Spanish-American War and a Medal of Honor recipient. And at one point, he was a one-term member of Congress from Alabama. He also owned a ranch in New Mexico, and he single-handedly funded the Anti-Saloon League in New Mexico, so he has a tie to our state. When he visited Albuquerque in 1912, and he was campaigning for prohibition, he was asked whether the president would support a national prohibition, and he said no, quote, Taft is a boozy swine, unquote. And at any time in our nation's history, I would challenge someone to say that's not a contemptuous words. And that telegram lists his words. Well, Taft let it go. And uh, as we'll see, as I return, others have let uh, similar or even far worse things go. But with that, I think it's helpful to do comparative history and comparative law and talk about why a Republican institution will has withstood uh, militaristic uh, movements and its history. And I'll hand this over to Professor Michael Nyberg to talk about France. Thank you very much for this invitation, Josh. And uh, as Josh mentioned, we lived in Colorado Springs for eight years and we spent uh, most of our vacation time in New Mexico, a state that we uh, both came to fall in love with. So uh, if I'm not there personally, at least I can be there a little bit virtually. Uh, and since you're all lawyers, you'll understand that uh, the lawyers here at the Army War College like it when I say that everything I'm about to say tonight is my personal opinion does not reflect the views of the United States government, the United States Army War College, the United States Army, or any subdivision therein. Uh, can I have the first slide, please, Josh? So a little while ago, we had a guest speaker come to the US Army War College, a very, very senior official in the US government, who said that when he took his job, he read all the stuff on civil military relations that they gave him, and he said none of it really seemed to fit. He said it rem civil military relations reminded him of being on a cramped commuter flight uh, and trying to share the armrest between you and your uh, co-passenger. He said, if you put your elbow a little bit too far on one side of the armrest, you could expect your neighbor to push back or give you uh, a glare. If you sit with both, si both of your arms at your side, your neighbor is gonna take that armrest. And if neither one of you wants to take the armrest and you both sit with your arms at the side, then the armrest goes unused, that, that vital real estate is unused. And his point was that civil military relations is a negotiation. And his point beyond that even was that civil military relations is a negotiation that is bounded in space and is bounded in time. Uh, those are my words, not his, but that this space is determined by history, it's determined by structure, it's determined by custom, and of course it's determined by law. Uh, these are two of the men that I'm gonna talk about tonight most. The man on the right is Georges Clemenceau, uh, nicknamed the Tiger. The man in uniform to the left is Ferdinand Foch, the man more responsible than anybody for developing the strategy that won the First World War. And one reason I love this picture is of course, they are not quite sharing an armrest, but you can see the two of them kind of elbowing each other. Uh, and, and I'll talk about the elbowing that they do at the end of the First World War. Clemenceau is a particularly interesting person because he is the man who coined this phrase, war is too important a business to leave to the generals. In other words, he believed that the generals were nothing more than armed servants of the state, uh, a concept, of course, that as Josh mentioned, we share in the United States as well. Could I get the next slide, please? Uh, the historical context for all of this that I want to talk about is the defeat of France in 1870, 1871 at the hands of what was then Prussia, and then the unification of Germany that came in January 1871, which was done in the Hall of Mirrors in Versailles. Uh, now, this is important for a couple of reasons. One is, of course, um, the historical context within which the Third Republic will get created, which is, can you, thank you, uh, which is the defeat of, 
back one place, oh, which is the defeat of the French army by an external enemy. So there's obviously a question from the very beginning of what went wrong with the French army. What did it not do that it was supposed to do in guarding the nation and its sovereignty? Uh, the second question was what had gone wrong on the home front? What had been wrong with the political institutions in France? So the, um, the zeitgeist of the moment, the, the um, zeitgeist may be bad when you're talking about France, but the, 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 the feeling of the moment is to create something uh, that becomes known, comes down in French history as radical republicanism. And this doesn't mean radical in the sense that we would use it. It means republicanism in a sense that will push aside some of the old institutions of France uh, and bring about brand new ones. And I wanna talk a little bit about that. The second incident that happens, next slide please, is the use of the French army uh, against the French people. So essentially what happens is the Germans declare the German empire in the palace of Versailles. There's a group inside Paris called the Paris Commune that rejects that new government, rises up inside Paris, declares itself an independent commune. And that same French army that had failed against the German army then marches into Paris and puts down the commune uh, at the death of tens of thousands of Frenchmen. This is the beautiful Hotel de Ville the City Hall of Paris, those of you who have been to Paris uh, will, will know the building that I'm talk to, talking about. This is it burned out and hollowed out at the end of the Paris Commune, which takes place in 1871. So the issue for France is how do we create an army that is large enough, powerful enough, strong enough to defend the interests of the nation, but will not do what it did in 1871, which is to turn around and fight against the French people. And just to put a, a, a footnote on this, in 1871, Georges Clemenceau, that prime minister that I showed you, was the, the, the head of one of the 20 arrondissements of Paris, the mayor of, of Montmartre. And Ferdinand Foch, the soldier, was a young private who came into the city of Paris shortly after all of this had happened. The first barracks that he stayed at, he writes in his memoirs, were covered with the blood of the communards. So you're talking about the, the need to kind of create institutions uh, to govern the army. Could I have the next slide, please? So this is the image that, uh, a cartoon image, of course, but this is one of the images of what uh, France wants to create. So this is a cartoon by a man named Jean-Jacques Waltz. He went by the name Ancy. Uh, he was Alsatian, uh, a very big French patriot. This is done in 1912. The Pont de Kell is over the Rhine River near Strasbourg. And the sign behind that soldier says, French Republic, one and indivisible. Here begins the land of liberty. You're leaving Germany and you're coming into France. So the idea here is that what you will do with France is you will create an institution that is representative of the French people, not representative of the French elite. And this is going to fit in perfectly with the way that Georges Clemenceau and the radical Republicans understand the army. To radical Republicans like Clemenceau, the thing that France has to watch out for is this concentration of power in the three traditional institutions of France that Clemenceau feared. One was the aristocracy, one was the church, and the third was the army. And these three things are very deeply connected. Uh, so the French word for cadet, the French word for youngest son is literally cadet. So we get the phrase cadet for a military student from this French understanding. The first son inherits the title, the second son goes to the church, the third son goes into the army, which was the tradition. Clemenceau wanted to put a stop to this, uh, which is why he's in favor of a very broad based conscription for the French army to make sure that it's not just aristocrats and practicing Catholics that go into the army. Clemenceau said, quote, the army is composed of civilians, closed in a certain fashion and subordinated to its special regime for a certain purpose. But men are neither better nor worse if they wear red pants or gray, a kepi or a bowler. In other words, whether they're in uniform or out, they're all servants of the nation in one way or another. So this is a, a, a real fear of the Republican project in France after 1871. How do you create an army that will be representative of the French people? One way to do it is to do it by conscription. Another way is to kind of very carefully control who enters the army. A third way, which is the preferred socialist method, is just not to have a central army at all, kind of like what Josh was talking about before, but create something based in, in what we would refer to as a national guard or a militia, something strong enough to defend the country, but not strong enough to attack it. And because the militia or national guard is from the people, the theory is they won't attack the people. And this was a, a tension that came into play in Lafayette Square uh, just last week, the question of whether residents of the District of Columbia wearing the National Guard uniform would in fact enforce an order against the people 
they live in and among, a traditional issue for the American National Guard as well. In my hometown of Pittsburgh, uh, it was a major issue in the 1870s when the Pittsburgh National Guard refused to fire on striking steel workers, so the governor called in Philadelphia National Guard's people, and I don't think the rivalry has healed itself uh, since. So right here's my Steeler Cup. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Now, the Third Republic uh, had some seams in it, had some weaknesses in it. It was built intentionally with a very weak executive branch, and it was built intentionally with a very weak cabinet. So the Third Republic is famous for cabinets changing out very, very quickly and changing out all the time. Uh, the first couple of months of the First World War, for example, France went through six different cabinets, I think in less than two years. This cartoon talks about something called the Dreyfus Affair, which I don't want to talk about because it is unbelievably complicated. But I'd like you to notice two things. One is that this single crisis, this single scandal in France, went on for 12 years. And the second thing I want you to notice is in this image, the soldiers, the men wearing the red hats and red pants uh, of Clemenceau's quotation, are on one side. The writers and civilians are on the other side. And the writer that's here is a man by the name of Emile Zola, uh, Zola used one of Georges Clemenceau's newspapers to write this thing called J'accuse, which accused the French army of uh, wrongly accusing Alfred Dreyfus of treason. That's, that's one crime, but the bigger crime in the minds of Zola and Clemenceau was that the army then tried to put itself above the laws of the state by creating a conspiracy that wasn't there, in effect trying to cover up uh, the crime at first and then trying to obfuscate it. That in the minds of the, the French center and left was the crime that the French army had committed. Uh, again, I don't wanna get into this uh, too deeply, but I do wanna say that part of the problem is institutional, which is to say there's no clear arm of the French government that is responsible for the military. There's no single arm that's responsible for it. There's nothing that we would recognize today as an interagency process in France, uh, really until after the second world war. And it's not really clear who in France, in the French constitution, makes these decisions. And again, if you're getting cabinets that are rotating all the time, that only increases the problem. So this is a, an issue that's going to uh, uh, um, plague France until 1959, when France writes uh, the Fifth Republic Constitution, and Charles de Gaulle comes in and says, I'm only going to accept this constitution if it comes with a much stronger executive. And I'll talk about that in just a bit as well. Can I have the next slide, please? This is my favorite of the French uh, crises. This is Georges Boulanger on the left, and you can tell by that image that he's not going to have a very happy ending to this. He is a uh, general, uh, in fact, he's a retired general by this point, who begins to develop a, po a political movement called the Boulangist movement in France, uh, which at first is very popular. A lot of people are trying to co-opt it and use that power to their own uses until it quickly becomes obvious that what Boulanger is really intending to do is create a coup against the Third Republic itself. That is, he's not arguing for a place within the Third Republic, he's arguing for just getting rid of it. Uh, by 1889, 1890, people are getting worried about this enough that you see this cartoon on the right, which actually appeared in a British newspaper. It has Marianne, the um, uh, symbol of France, uh, twirling a, 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 a French Republican symbol, that hat that is there and asking whether Boulanger is going to destroy the French Republic. Uh, now, the reason I love this scandal is because of the way that it ends. Boulanger's mistress is in Belgium. He goes to visit her, actually he's being kind of pushed by, a, by political tensions into Belgium. Uh, she dies of tuberculosis. He shoots himself on her grave, like you can't make this stuff up. It's a perfect 19th century uh, French scandal. And that ends the problem of Boulangerism, but it doesn't end the problem of how to control the military and what to do about the military. So what I wanna do in the short time I have left is talk about the real crisis here and then talk about a little bit of the um, comparisons we can make to the United States. So could we do the next slide, please? There's Ferdinand Foch again. Um, Foch by October of 1918 is perfectly well aware that the armies he is commanding, the French, British and American armies for the most part are going to win this war and that he'll find himself in a position to write armistice terms to get the German army to stop fighting. In early October, Foch is begging the, the French government, please, Mr. Clemenceau, tell me what France's political goals are. Tell me what negotiations we have with our allies. What should I be writing in these armistice terms? And the answer that he gets back from the foreign minister, Stéphane Pichon, is uh, that's our problem, it's not yours just end the war, we'll take care of the politics. And 
It's about this time that Woodrow Wilson is supposed to have said that borders have nothing to do with soldiers. In other words, this is not something for him to be involved in. Now, Foch has a very different approach to this. Uh, he believes, I think quite rightly at least, that at least at this stage, that he can't really do an armistice unless he understands the political purpose for which the French government thinks its armies are fighting. Uh, among those goals, uh, what Foch wants is to, is to separate out the Rhineland, which is that western part of Germany that's in the blue box here, west of the Rhine River, and separate it out and make it a separate country. And in some wild fantasies of the French right, they want this annexed to, uh, to France. I actually found a document where one of these nationalists argues that the Rhineland makes better wine than it does beer, therefore it must really be French. Now that's not what Foch is arguing. What he's arguing for is creating a separate country, a kind of buffer zone, and connecting it to the Netherlands and Belgium by an economic agreement, a customs union, and, an, and a collective security agreement. Foch is adamantly uh, for this. Clemenceau is adamantly opposed to it because he believes that if France does this, he'll lose the support of the United States and Great Britain. What Clemenceau has in mind is a kind of permanent Anglo-French American alliance that will uh, ensure French security going forward. When it becomes obvious to Foch that Clemenceau has no intention of breaking the Rhineland away, Foch starts playing in political games inside Germany himself. He reaches out to the young mayor of Cologne, a man by the name of Konrad Adenauer, uh, recruits Adenauer into this plot. Uh, and then at a certain point in May of 1919, when it becomes obvious that um, the peace treaty is going to be done and they're going to need the Germans to sign it, they call Foch in and they say, hey, is the army ready to march on Berlin if the Germans don't sign it? To which Foch said, no, uh, the army has been demobilized. It doesn't have money. It doesn't have men. What we're going to do if they don't agree to sign, we're going to exempt the Rhineland and Bavaria from reparations. And those two states will join us in a march on Berlin. Clearly, he's crossing over from one side of the armrest over to the other. Uh, when Clemenceau dismisses him from the Treaty of Versailles uh, negotiations at that point, Foch went to a British newspaper, the Daily Mail, so that the French government couldn't censor him. And he gave this interview in a London newspaper in which he said, the women who gave their husbands for France will one day have to give up their sons as well and calling Clemenceau an old daughter. Uh, at that point, the relationship between these two men completely breaks down. Uh, it's actually kind of fun to read. They both gave really nasty interviews about the other one and insisted that they couldn't be published until both men were dead. So we actually have posthumous interviews that get published where there's no gloves. They go after each other. Uh, this is a major problem, as you might guess, uh, of what to do. And as you also know, some of these problems will come about in the Second World War as well. But I want to jump forward a little bit here um, to an issue that happened just a couple of years ago in the summer of 2017. And I was uh, fortunate enough, I was in France uh, when all this happened. President Macron had just been elected, as you can see from this photograph. I like this picture as well. This is a very young, uh, recently elected uh, Emmanuel Macron, still kind of feeling his way through uh, exactly what his responsibilities are as president of France. One of his major rivals was a politician named Francois Fillon, who is much further to the right politically uh, than Macron was. Uh, the man that's standing behind him is the chief of defense, General uh, Philippe de Villiers, who was uh, opposed, uh, really strongly opposed, to Macron's plan to cut the French defense budget. Uh, this led to the, a major, major scandal in 2017 in France, both over the cutting of the budget, which was an issue in and of itself, but the fact that Philippe de Villiers' brother was a senior advisor and very close friend to Macron's rival, Francois Fillon. So there, when I was over in France, uh, this, this happened. There was a shouting match between the two of them. Uh, in this shouting match, Macron screamed at Philippe de Villiers, I am your boss. We cannot have a public disagreement. This is how our institutions have to work. And that's how the institutions, in fact, did work. Villiers resigned. Uh, there was no coup in France. Nobody was particularly happy with any of this, uh, least of all Macron. Uh, but the institutions of France were strong enough that the crisis didn't go uh, much further. Uh, last thing I want to do, because I only have a couple of minutes left, and I certainly don't want to infringe on Rick's time. Could I get the last slide, please? I think there are some comparisons that we can make between the French system and what France has gone through and what the United States uh, has recently gone through. And I like this photograph as well, uh, because neither President Macron nor President Trump in this photograph appear particularly comfortable in a military review. Neither of them have their eyes on the, uh, I guess those are Air Force people, right, Josh? Airmen uh, over yes. 
uh, being, being uh, reviewed there. We can look at a couple of things that are in comparison and contrast. In both countries, the United States and France, uh, this fundamental issue of how to create a military that can protect the nation's interests, as General Martin Dempsey liked to say, can keep this country immune from external coercion, yet at the same time not threaten the rights and liberties of the American people. And Josh hinted at some of the ways that we do this in the United States by keeping generals under the Uniform Code of Military Justice, by having a National Guard that kind of divides military authority, by having a Congress that can cut the funding in almost any minute. Uh, these things go on in France as well. Uh, and what they do is they create seams inside the way that we uh, understand the way to govern uh, our military. There are legal seams, cultural seams that have to be filled in with tradition and with the ways that things are done, with a kind of ethic that goes through it. And Josh and I were talking about this the other day um, I've spoken to five JAGs about whether or not the president had the legal authority uh, to use the Insurrection Act uh, last week. I got five different answers from five very talented judge advocate generals. All five agreed that the real issue wasn't a legal one. It was a question of whether this was the right thing to do or not. So in other words, what I'm trying to suggest is that the law is not quite as clear cut as that guest visitor to the Army War College said, the theories don't always match the reality that you get. The second thing I think that it shows, uh, both France and the United States have developed cultures of nonpartisanship, but that doesn't mean that they're apolitical militaries. And those are terms that political scientists sometimes use to divide an institution like the military, which is nonpartisan, which is to say that it, it, it is careful not to choose sides, but it is not apolitical in the sense that it always has its own interests that it's looking out for. And in the case of the United States, what you see coming through quite clearly in the past couple of weeks, I think, from people like General Mattis and Admiral McRaven, is that one of the things that they value, one of the political things they're willing to stand up for, ironically enough, is the ability to remain nonpartisan. So this is a, a tightrope that both the French and the United States have had to walk. The last one I might draw is a contrast. Uh, my French colleagues, when they come to the Army War College and French military friends, when they come here, uh, are quite surprised and quite, I would say, envious of the exalted state that the military holds in, in the American eye, holds in American society. Uh, I was with a French friend of mine one time when we were in a, a Home Depot uh, and they gave him a 15% military discount. And he was stunned because nothing like this would ever happen in France. Uh, I was with the same officer. We were in, he was in dress uniform with some of the Americans when we went to pay our lunch bill and somebody had paid the bill for him. He said nothing like that would ever happen in France. France has a, a military that is still understood in Republican terms, which is to say that your service is no more special than mine as a teacher or so-and-so's as a lawyer or so-and-so's as a veterinarian. You're all servants of the state. In the United States, we don't quite have quite that same culture. Uh, and in talking to some senior officers or listening to them through webinars like this one last week, uh, they all repeated the need to protect that in the United States. That is to say, uh, a former cabinet secretary who I don't think I should mention because I think he was speaking off the record, said that his biggest fear of the events of last week was that the moral authority of the federal police had been denigrated because of the events last week. What he did not want to see was the moral authority of American soldiers experiencing that same uh, uh, degeneration. In France, that tension is a little bit different. Uh, in France, that is uh, not played out quite the same way as it is the United, in the United States, but there is the same issue of making sure that the French military is understood by the French people as staying inside the boxes that it's supposed to stay in. In conclusion, all I wanna say uh, about this is that struggles over the armrest are normal, that this process is always going to be one of negotiation, and that it's always one that needs an awful lot of hand care and feeding and needs an awful lot of communication, even if it's unspoken communication between the two passengers on either side of the armrest. With that, I'll uh, turn it over to uh, my good friend, Rick. And Rick, and Rick, right. the uh, floor is yours. Okay, uh, so I guess first first slide. There we go. Um, so first of all, uh, thank you, uh, Josh, for inviting me. Uh, it, it, it's wonderful uh, uh, to be participating in this panel discussion. Uh, uh, Josh and I studied under the same doctoral director, whose first uh, 
uh, teaching position was at University of New Mexico. And I, I think he's probably looking down and smiling to see us both participating in a panel discussion at his uh, first teaching job uh, and finding it quite, quite amusing. Uh, you know, following Mike Nyberg, uh, Mike and I have been friends for a long time, but following Mike, I feel like a comedian who has to do a set after Robin Williams has been on the stage. Uh, so <laughs> hopefully everybody is uh, still in a, is in a good mood. You know, uh, following, uh, talking about Germany after talking about France reminds me of uh, Eugene Weber, very famous uh, French historian at UCLA, uh, wrote a book called The Hollow Years in which he characterized the, uh, uh, compared and contrast France and Germany in the period as Athens versus Sparta. And I think certainly uh, if we look at uh, some of the issues that Mike raised regarding the French traditions of republicanism in relation to the army, uh, and then we compare it to what I'm going to talk about, which is civil military relations in Germany between 1918 and 1938, there is a stark contrast uh, in, the, in, in that, the, the behavior of those institutions and how the institutions reacted to or related to their, their, their civilian governments. Uh, I should say, uh, this is a very important uh, subject, certainly civil military relations in Germany. Uh, and this period we refer to as the Weimar Republic, the period between the uh, uh, end of Imperial Germany, the end of World War I, uh, and the assumption of the Nazis to power uh, by 1933, although the Weimar Constitution is technically still alive, but barely in, into the mid 1930s. Um, certainly it's important because we're all aware comparisons have been thrown around for the past several years about where we are and how to, uh, are there parallels to the situation uh, in the interwar years and particularly um, in regards to political developments in Germany at this time. You know, as, as Josh said, this is a huge topic, uh, studying the German generals and German army uh, and their relationship to democracy and much ink has been spilt on this subject. Uh, but in the time that I have, uh, I want to highlight what I consider the six most significant issues of this period uh, in Germany. So Josh, if you could put a slide, next slide. So here's a map of, of Weimar, Germany. I know it's in German, but by God, it's a beautiful map. And I thought that uh, it would do well to show the borders of, of uh, Weimar, Germany uh, after uh, World War I. Uh, so here's what Mike Nyberg was talking about. Can you see my cursor moving here? Is that, no, I guess not. Uh, uh, the French, well, that's right, because Josh has control. Uh, but uh, anyway, this is a wonderful, right, show Al, uh, yeah, Alsace, very good, and Lorraine, uh, which went over to France. And if you scooch over to Poland to the Danzig Corridor, uh, you can see, you know, that Germany itself had lost, uh, lost uh, some territory, significant territory after World War uh, One. Now, uh, first and foremost, the army of Germany uh, after World War I, it's referred to as the Reichswehr. And the Reichswehr um, is the name of the German armed, for, uh, German armed forces, or uh, German army in particular, armed forces from 1919 to 1935. And in 1935, it assumes the title of Wehrmacht. So anyone who studies Nazi Germany or World War II, you've heard the term Wehrmacht. And that means the armed forces of Germany. And that was, name was uh, uh, given to it in 1935. So here I want to go over the six main points and then go into greater sort of detail on how this, um, all of this relationship evolves. Uh, first and foremost, the Reichswehr never accepted the legitimacy of the Weimar Republic. It never accepted it, the Republic. They never, the generals who were in charge of the Reichswehr, uh, never saw themselves as subordinate to the Republic, uh, but partners at best in the preservation of Germany although their definition of Germany was often at odds uh, with the political leadership's definition of Germany. The second point is that the army initially perceived the Weimar government as a threat to Germany, to the Germany that they understood and defined because of its leftist revolutionary origins. And the army was always more fearful of communism rather than fascism, though both groups were seen as illegitimate uh, although by the 30s, this would in fact change. Uh, once conservative parties controlled the Reichstag, the German parliament, the chancellorship and the presidency beginning in 1925, the Reichswehr leadership uh, was more confident in the relationship between army and state, but still it, they saw themselves as equals, not subordinate. It didn't matter what the constitution of Weimar Germany said. Uh, now, third point, uh, the Reichswehr generals established the principle 
that they would not involve themselves in politics and officers would not be members of any political parties, yet the Reichswehr was intimately and actively involved in former and informal politics in Germany from 1918 to 1939. So that's the cover story, but the reality is completely the opposite. Um, in 1933, Hitler will play upon the general's desire to restore Germany to its position as a continental power in order to protect it from its enemies, such as Poland and the Soviet Union, which was seen as and was the coordinator of inter international communist movements. Uh, five, the senior officers had been wary of Hitler and the Nazis when they came to power in 1933, although that will change within 18 months of Hitler's regime. And Hitler will seal his relationship with the generals by purging the Nazi party in June 34 of those persons such as Ernst Röhm and other SA and old guard leaders that for ideological reasons questioned the legitimacy of the government even under Hitler. And finally, my sixth point is that by 1938, all institutions in Germany, except the army and the churches were Nazified. Uh, Hitler will control the army by removing the senior, the two most senior generals, Blomberg and Fritsch, and I'll talk about that at the end of my, uh, my time, uh, because he had already established a personal relationship with many of the senior high ranking officers. And this relationship was based upon favors regular bribes of cash and later land, uh, and also assignment to command of combat units in the ever-expanding Wehrmacht. So this is a completely different situation and relationship than what Mike talked about in regards to France um, in the interwar period. Um, so uh, yeah, very good. So I I'd, uh, begun by saying that the army, the Reichswehr, never recognizes the legitimacy of the Weimar Republic because the Weimar Republic was born out of a revolution in, on November 9th, 1918. Uh, World War I is still going on. The, clear, the war was going to uh, end up in a defeat for Germany. Uh, the Ottomans had been knocked out. The Austrians had been knocked out. Germany stood alone. Their armies were being pushed back and Mike could talk about this much better than I could. Um, but uh, Hindenburg and Ludendorff who were the two senior generals uh, uh, had uh, spoken with the emperor, Kaiser Wilhelm II, uh, had said that victory could not be achieved. That's how they framed it. Uh, the Kaiser balked at seeking some other solution uh, and German parliament, particularly the uh, Socialist Party of Germany and the United Socialist Party and the coalition of left-wing parties stage a revolution on November 9th, 1918 that successfully overthrows the monarchy and the imperial state. And so the Weimar Republic is born at, in the, at the end of World War I, uh, and it is the reason why World War I ends in Germany, because with the Republic uh, being established, at least with the revolution and parliament, a provisional parliament, they are the ones that negotiate the armistice uh, two days later on November 11th, 1918, which it becomes the uh, de facto end of World War I, right, uh, on uh, November 11th. Um, but the army never sees uh, this government that's born of leftist revolution as legitimate. And this is part of the reason why. And during the revolution uh, and in the days after the revolution and the weeks after the revolution, the provisional government was very nervous about in fact, what the army was going to do. Was the German army going to overthrow this revolution and this Republic, this newly born Republic and restore the monarchy? Was this going to be a civil war? There was great uncertainty. Uh, next slide. So here we get a very interesting uh, and, and I think really a good foundational understanding of the relationship between the German army and the civil government. Um, we have here on the left, Friedrich Ebert, who was the um, head of the Socialist Party of Germany. He was the provisional president of the new republic and would become the first elected president of the republic until uh, 1925. Uh, Ebert understands uh, that the army is the greatest danger to the security of the new state and of the revolution. Uh, and, he and he is concerned about his more radical colleagues, not only within his own party, but within uh, other parties, the United Socialist Party uh, of Germany, which saw the uh, SPD as splitters uh, and to, to uh, milk toast. So Ebert uh, uh, begins a phone conversation uh, with 
uh, uh, Wilhelm Groner. Groner was quartermaster general, and at that time he was head essentially of the German armed forces uh, after the resignation of Ludendorff and Hindenburg. And Groner um, was considered by his colleagues in the army a liberal, and please uh, understand that to be called a liberal in the German Imperial Army is not actually a liberal as that we would define it. Uh, but Groner understood that, for, first of all, the war was over, Germany could not win, and what was most important was the preservation and stability of Germany. So he was willing to negotiate with Frederick Ebert on um, what the conditions would be for the army to behave. Okay, and this is really important and why the Reichswehr leadership uh, and the German army leadership in the years after don't see themselves as subordinate, uh, but see themselves as partners because they negotiated the deal uh, that would create the stability, eventually stability of the new Weimar government. And that deal um, uh, dealt with Eber promising that the uh, labor unions that ran the railroads would allow for the demobilization of the army uh, at the rate that the army leadership wanted. Uh, and there are a few other things, but I think most importantly, Groner also said that the army, uh, one of the primary conditions is that the new government would not seek to prosecute or to fire generals and officers, but that the army would be in charge of demobilization of itself, right? So in fact, the, what Groner wants is no political oversight in the restructuring of the army in the post-war uh, situation in the new government. Ebert agrees uh, and we have this uh, understanding. Uh, and this understanding allows for this transition and it doesn't, uh, and it results in uh, a peaceful, well, not really peaceful, but there's no army counter-revolution uh, that, that seeks to overthrow uh, the Weimar government at this time. Now, tied to this, of course, is the issue of loyalty of the army. Uh, all German officers in up to 1918, up, to, up through November 9th, 1918, and even those who are senior officers or junior officers, anyone who's in the army uh, at this time as an officer was commissioned under the empire. And their oath of loyalty was to the Kaiser, to the emperor, who was overthrown and sent into exile. Mo many of the senior generals were monarchists uh, uh, and uh, they were not particularly pleased about this political change that had in fact occurred. And therefore the creation of the Weimar Republic, the fact that these officers had not taken an oath of loyalty to the constitution of a new Germany, but to the, to the Kaiser um, created problems. In August, 1919, the Weimar Constitution had been established and the Reichswehr was asked to take an oath of loyalty to that constitution. Uh, some units and some officers did, but others did not. And there was resistance and rejection and conditions placed upon that oath. And in March, 1922, the oath was revised, but the only way the army would accept it is if the oath was not to the constitution of Germany, but to the fatherland, right, to Germany. Right, and that's very, very important. Because I think Mike would attest that uh, the French take an oath to the Republic, to the Constitution. Uh, and in Germany, this is not, of course, the case with the Reichswehr. Now, to make matters worse, this fear of, um, oh, um, yeah, you can now go to the next slide, Josh. Yeah, thanks. Uh, this fear of the left uh, and the revolutionary movements within Germany that the army had uh, uh, came to fruition in January 1919, not two months after the creation of the Republic with a, and a communist revolution in Germany called the Spartacus Revolt. Spartacus was the name of the German communist movement. Uh, and within two months of the end of World War I, there is a communist revolution in Germany. Uh, the Weimar government uh, would not allow the army to play an active role in suppressing the revolution, but ask the army for help in the creation of volunteer units or militias or national guard that would uh, be formed to fight uh, the, the communists, the Spartacists. And so we have the creation of the Fry Corps, uh, which are volunteer units that are armed uh, by the army. Uh, and in fact, what the army does is it furloughs a lot of officers and soldiers and allows them to serve as private citizens. Plus Germany has many veterans who are willing to return to Freikorps uniform uh, 
uh, or to enter Freikorps uniform to fight against the communists. And so the communist revolution, uh, in fact, is crushed. It's, it's crushed within Berlin in a matter of a couple of weeks. And it takes about, I guess, about a month or two for much of it to be destroyed or the most of it to be destroyed with remnants uh, being eliminated by June 1919. So if you're, the army leadership looks at this government as weak, uh, that its fear of revolutionary origins has just been, uh, in fact, fulfilled this nightmare scenario of communist revolution, uh, and the Spartacist revolt ends, the last vestiges and holdouts are in June 1919, which also happens to be the month that the Versailles Treaty is signed in Paris. Uh, and the Versailles Treaty, which is seen as a humiliation to Germany, uh, and in fact, uh, again, affirms to the military leadership that they question the new government's uh, defense of the fatherland or what Germany is uh, to the Reichswehr leaders. And, and I might say that the Reichswehr officers are not necessarily entirely in agreement on what Germany is anyway. Uh, but they certainly agree that it's not the communists and they are very wary of this revolutionary movement and this attempted revolution uh, in, in Germany. And for those who are watching, uh, that uh, who are not historians, this is contemporary of the Russian Civil War. The Bolshevik Revolution was launched in uh, November, December 19, uh, the 17, and the Russian Civil War is going on at this moment in time. So this is seen as sort of a European-wide communist threat. It's not a theoretical threat, it's a real threat, and it's happening outside the windows in Berlin and in other major cities throughout, uh, throughout Germany. Um, now, uh, I should say that the relationship between uh, the army and the government continues to uh, decline steadily, um, but, uh, and the army behaves itself as the political leadership becomes more conservative, as the radical parties, um, the USPD uh, is not involved in coalition government, center and conservative parties begin to gain some traction. And in fact, um, uh, when coalition governments include center left, center right, the Viceroy leadership is a bit more comfortable. And this brings us to probably one of the most important people within the Reichswehr relationship, Josh, next slide, uh, which is Hans von Zecht. Uh, he's the fellow at center with the binoculars. You can tell he is a, a Prussian officer because he has a monocle, that's the requirement. Uh, and so Hans von Zecht was the head of uh, the Reichswehr uh, and from 1920 through 1926. And he is responsible for establishing a working relationship uh, with the Weimar government, particularly the more conservative members of parliament uh, such as Foreign Minister Gustav Stresemann, uh, later, of course, Hindenburg, when Hindenburg becomes president. But von Zecht still never fully trusts the Weimar government. And he will pursue secret military agreements with foreign powers without permission of, in fact, the Weimar government. The most famous, uh, again, Mike knows this, well, the Rapallo Agreement, the secret agreement, the secret military agreement between the Reichswehr and the Red Army where the Red Army uh, in 1923 and the Reichswehr make a secret agreement to cooperate in developing weapons together in the Soviet Union, something you wouldn't expect of a Reichswehr officer. So here you have um, Reichswehr leaders making deals and treaties, and it's clear that the conservatives within the Weimar government know something's up because they're approving you know, budgets, right? The budget, the, the payrolls and the budgets for the Reichswehr come out of uh, the civilian government. But uh, von Secht is the one that develops the clandestine weapons uh, programs and he's, at grad and he's aided by conservatives uh, in parliament. But uh, this doesn't uh, end the tensions between the two. Uh, next slide. Uh, uh, and uh, although you have uh, Paul von Hindenburg, the great hero of World War I, as far as the Germans were concerned, and he would be happy to tell you, uh, he becomes president in 1925 and will remain president until he dies in office in 1934. Um, but even though there is now a strong conservative government as president and in parliament and a conservative center coalition, uh, this doesn't reduce the tensions. And in fact, uh, von Zecht is forced to resign in 1926 when he pays a visit to the Kaiser in exile in the Netherlands. And there are a variety of other um, controversies between Weimar Republic and the Reichswehr leadership. Uh, let me move forward because of my time is short. 
uh, to the relationship between uh, Hitler's assumption of power and Reichswehr generals. Um, <clears throat> Hitler and the Nazis were not uh, looked at fondly by the military leadership of the Reichswehr, who tended to be from noble families, from Prussian or North German families. Uh, Hitler, you know, was Austrian, let alone, uh, you know, the Nazi party headquarters was in Bavaria. Uh, and if you speak to, uh, uh, Otto von Bismarck once said, you know, an Austrian, a Bavarian is halfway between an Austrian and a human. Uh, so there's a lot of regional animosity uh, between these different groups. Uh, but Hitler understood the power politics of the situation. And when he comes to power in 1933, um, he has to balance the more radical elements. And again, there, the, to say more radical elements of the Nazi party, you have to understand the ideology and the party dynamic, but the party itself saw itself as revolutionary. Any, any participation in the Weimar government was illegitimate. So when Hitler becomes chancellor, there were those who were the uh, old radicals of the party who thought that he had betrayed the party by uh, becoming chancellor. So one of them is his friend Ernst Röhm, who was head of the uh, Sturmabteilungen, the uh, SA, the stormtroopers. Uh, and uh, they challenged Hitler for political power in the first year that Hitler was chancellor. Hitler sees the army and the generals as in fact this counterweight. And he allays the fears of the generals in the Nazi assumption of power by telling the generals very quickly that after he comes to power that there are two pillars to the new Germany. One is the Nazi party and two is the German army. And he begins a clandestine rearmament of Germany at this time. And he begins to cater to uh, the general's concept of what is a strong Germany. Uh, um, through rearmament, through vir virulent anti-communist policies, the Communist Party is outlawed. Um, but uh, all of this uh, comes to a head in June of 1934, when Hitler carries out a purge of the Nazi party called uh, the Blood Purge or Night of the Long Knives. Um, in the year leading up to June of 34, Röhm and other SA leaders wanted Hitler to demand that the army train the SA, that the SA become the new army of Germany. Uh, and as you might imagine, that would lead the German army to act against the Nazi party because it was a self-preservation. So Hitler had a choice and the choice was either backing Rome and the SA generals who questioned his own legitimacy or backing the army. And so he goes to the army and asks the army for military support for trucks, gasoline, and guns to give the SS and have the SS purge the Nazi party. Uh, and the army is complicitous in it. Uh, and the army had for many years, for decades, actually uh, uh, not acknowledged their role in this. And in the 1980s, a uh, wonderful multi-volume official, semi-official military history of the, of the German army uh, called Germany in the Second World War in its English translation, uh, established very clearly that the Reichswehr was integrally involved in the Night of the Long Knives. And so the army is in fact in with Hitler uh, and sees his purge of the radicals in his party who they see as radicals as Hitler being uh, more reasonable. Uh, and this leads, go ahead, Josh, you were right, you anticipated correctly, uh, that two months later, uh, the uh, question of loyalty oaths is, is answered. And in August of 1934, uh, the Reichswehr takes an oath of loyalty, but it's an oath of loyalty to the Führer of the Reich, to Hitler, not to the constitution, because that's irrelevant, not to Germany, but to the Führer, the leader of Germany, meaning to Hitler personally. Uh, and we see basically the army uh, now, uh, over the course of the next few years, uh, uh, bribed, supported uh, as senior officers uh, joining the ranks of supporters of Hitler. And in the end here, my last, uh, the, uh, the slide, the next slide, uh, this really comes to fruition in 1937, 38, when Hitler presents to the senior military leadership, Blomberg was the war minister, Fritsch head of the army, uh, and he says to them, we're going to go after Czechoslovakia, after the Sudetenland. Uh, we're going to the following year annex Austria. Blomberg and Fritsch argue with Hitler, but they don't argue what he wants to do. They challenge him on timetables. They said, we won't be ready next year if the French and if the British decide to act. And that Hitler saw this challenge on timetables uh, as a challenge to his authority. And in the, over the next year, 
uh, with the Gestapo, both Blomberg and Fritsch are blackmailed into resigning. Uh, and uh, Blomberg's son-in-law, Wilhelm Keitel, uh, uh, succeeds him as head of, next slide, as head of the German Armed Forces, which is now the Wehrmacht. And Keitel will be the one of the, 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 the duo with Alfred Jodl, who joins in 39, as the senior office commanders of the German Armed Forces until 1945. Um, and so there you see sort of that evolution, uh, but unlike France, certainly unlike the United States, the Reichswehr, the German armed forces are never loyal to the Weimar Republic and never take an oath of loyalty to the constitution. And that creates that situation where they reject the legitimacy of the government and are able to be applied by more radical elements like Hitler and the Nazis. So with that, I apologize for running over, but, but there we are. Well, not, not at all, Rick. And, um... That's an important point that uh, Professor Schneid, you bring up. The United, when, you, when you enter into a military commission in the United States, you swear an oath to uphold the United States Constitution, not a person, not the president. So whenever we hear a president talk about my generals, it often gives my peers and I, people that I've known of all walks of life in all of the service branches, a bit of a queasy feeling because the United States military is not loyal to a president, follows a president's orders. Um, lately, you've heard the president talk about my general. He referred to Mattis that way, but then he referred to uh, General M Miley that way. Well, I, I want to bring this back to the United States and talk about civil military relations and why we're, the, why we're different, but why there's, there's a worry. So the traditional view of civil military relations was best formulated most recently. I talk about the 1950s when Huntington wrote this is basically this, the military always has to remain subordinate to the constitution. He believed in the fear of a standing army. And when you go to military schools, whether it's ROTC or the service academies and you work your way up, you read Huntington as though it's like the third or fourth Bible and you you live by it. And that is military officers swear an oath to uphold the constitution. The orders are presumed to be lawful until they're not. And you cannot, unlike the police, say I was only following orders. If there's an illegal order, such as a war crime, it is not a defense to say I was following orders. It's a very tight legalistic um, existence for the military. Professionalism in the military is premised, though, not only on military officers remaining subordinate to the Constitution, it's all, and here's the problem we're in today, it's premised on the commander in chief and the military and Congress both respecting the military subordination to the Constitution. So when a president uses the military for questionable acts, acts that courts might not find to be unconstitutional through a doctrine of non-justiciable political question, which doesn't answer anything, um, that imperils the traditional civil military construct. Now, Professor Jonathan Turley, who you, you may recall recently, uh, I won't say he defended President Trump in Congress before the House, he, he defended a point of view, which I'm convinced he would have defended had it been Hillary Clinton or Franklin Roosevelt or anybody else facing impeachment. Um, he takes it a step further than Huntington does when he issues a cautionary note, and I suspect he would stick with this. Uh, he argued these points well before Donald Trump's presidency. The military's existed as a separate society. The separate society is unhealthy for the constitution, therefore the military should remain small in size and more integrated into society. Over time, the military's leadership has become politicized precisely because politicians, both in the Senate particularly and in the presidencies have tried to use them for photo ops um, and to call people out as my general and the like. And this is not what Madison intended and his followers when they drafted the Constitution. Now, I will argue that Professor Turley's arguments aren't necessarily original to him. William O. Douglas argued this in 1955 in a magazine um, article in Look magazine titled, We've Become Victims of the Military Mind. And that is, is that politicians are too quick to use the military for a variety of things that the military is not supposed to do namely presidents running for office and uh, surrounding themselves for photo ops and becoming overly militaristic. Now, 
There is a theory, and I, be I believe, and this is just Josh Kastenberg speaking, that this theory has tremendous danger to it called the unitary executive theory. Professor John Yu and David Addington, who you may remember from the Bush administration, have argued that Huntington has gotten it wrong and that the military owes absolute fealty to the commander in chief. Now, I saw this firsthand with the torture memorandum when I was working in the Pentagon and the judge advocates generals opposed the general counsels of the Department of Defense and White House counsel Alberto Gonzalez, the judge advocates generals and the chiefs of staff they advised were very firm that under no circumstances should military members be involved in waterboarding or other forms of torture. Obviously the military has no control over the CIA or other intelligence agencies which are civilian in nature and they testified to this end that, that the military would not engage in Geneva Convention violations. They would be unlawful orders. And they testified to Congress as they were retired to do, required to do by the Constitution. But Addington and you wanted them all dismissed for doing so because in their mind, it was against what President Bush and White House counsel had championed, which was the Geneva Conventions only reply to, apply to nation states and the Taliban and um, Al-Qaeda and others aren't nation states. Well, this is the current administration subscribes to the UN Addington doctrine of agency. And so when President Trump not too long ago demanded the silence or obsequious conduct of former Secretary of Defense James Mattis or Chief of Staff, John Kelly, it's not surprising. And here's why it's not surprising. These are three of the biggest advocates of the unitary executive theory. Note one of them is our current attorney general and the other is sitting on the Supreme Court. And of course there's Richard Cheney who as vice president advanced this theory and pushed it onto George W. Bush throughout the presidency. Why do we worry about this? Well, I'm convinced if you wanna know who told President Trump it was fine and dandy to threaten to use the active duty military to suppress a, a demonstrations and walk to the church. It's the gentleman who's our attorney general right now who subscribes to this theory. Now, sometimes people have asked about Britain and when I, when I do a presentation like this, they'll say, well, what about Britain? Isn't Britain somewhat unitary and aren't we more like them? There's only been one instance and I won't even call it a mutiny where British generals and retired generals were upset at the government and voice their dissension, one in modern history. And that had to do with the Irish Home Rule Bill. And if you understand British history and the British aristocracy, like in France, the second and third born sons didn't inherit the title. So what did the wealthy families do? They gave them properties in Northern Ireland, Protestant Ireland. So in 1914, when Ireland was to go free in its entirety, a handful of generals threatened to rebel. They didn't actually rebel, but one of the reasons they didn't rebel is that British institutions were quite strong. They've had a constitution, albeit an unwritten constitution that's been slowly developing since 1215. Parliament was elected. And even if it were the Liberal Party of par Parliament under Prime Minister Asquith, they were going to um, follow it or face some problem. And the reason they were going to face some problems is that King George V told the generals and retired generals who were squawking that while he didn't appreciate or approve necessarily of the Home Rule Bill, for Ireland, that was the law of the land, so they better knock it off. Now, the so-called Kara mutiny concerned President Woodrow Wilson because he worried about, well, what would the United States Army do if there were something roughly similar, although I don't think there's an equivalent of a Kara mutiny or in Northern Ireland to the United States. Um, but it was front page news in the New York Times. It's just been forgotten about because two months after the Kara mutiny, the Archduke of, um, the Austro-Hungarian Empire was assassinated and the headlines began writing about the assassination in World War I. Well, have generals spoken in American history and crossed the line? And, and the answer to that is yes. And I'll just do real briefly as to why and how they were politically championed in, in doing so for nefarious causes, but a republic stood strong. So this is General Van Horn Mosley. General Van Horn Mosley was championed by the Deutsch American Bund in the 1930s after he retired. He promoted the idea of a fascist state. He called Roosevelt a communist and Eleanor Roosevelt even worse terms. Um, he was anti-Semitic. He argued that um, 
immigrant, non-white immigrants should be forcibly sterilized on their entry into the United States. Um, but he had a handful of members of Congress, particularly in the South, uh, Joseph Starnes is one of them, who championed him. Uh, when Roosevelt nominated Felix Frankfurter to the Supreme Court, uh, Mosley took on the hustings and gave a speech before the Deutsch American Bund and the Knights of the White Camellia in, in Philadelphia, arguing that the country had turned communist and Zionist at the same time. There's a letter at the Library of Congress from Mosley to former President Herbert Hoover in 1942, arguing the Japanese really weren't the enemy of the United States. It was, it was the Jews and the Chinese. He was a bit, that's Mosley. Um, Hoover sent him back the letter and said, I'm really not interested in your views. Edwin Walker is another one. Edwin Walker in the 1950s, um, actually you may recognize him for being at Little Rock in command of the 101st Airborne when Eisenhower federalized the guard and ordered the military uh, into, uh, into enforce Brown versus Board of Education. But Walker never had his heart in it and he, he retired. And then he joined segregationist causes. And when he went back to Little Rock and uh, went on the radio shows and early television shows arguing that Eisenhower and then Kennedy were communists, um, he was anti-civil rights. Um, actually, Robert Kennedy ordered him arrested and sent for a psychological evaluation, but the psyche eval came back that he was fine, not really, but he was fine. Um, and he tried to undermine the Kennedy administration continually. It, nothing happened to him. And then John Singlaub butted heads with President Jimmy Carter over force reductions and then became an officer in the John Birch Society when he left office. And what you can see both with Walker is John Stennis is supporting him and Barry Goldwater is supporting Singlaub. When Carter forced Singlaub to retire for publicly speaking out against Carter's foreign policy, Barry Goldwater took to the hustings too. And he said, well, the wrong man resigned today with Singlob standing next to him. The interesting thing about Sting Singlob is this, if you wanna know who Ronald Reagan turned to to violate the Boland Amendment in the Iran-Contra Iran -Contra uh, uh, scandal, it was Singlob in retirement. They're not alone. These retired generals openly supported segregation. Bonner Fellers who was General Douglas MacArthur's intelligence chief during World War II. After his retirement, he spoke out against the US involvement in NATO. He claimed NATO was a communist organization and Eisenhower was a, com a closet communist. The Republic has survived these guys. It's also survived generals who've been rather truthful and idealistic in their assessments. This is uh, Marine Corps General David Shoup. He's a Medal of Honor recipient in the middle is General Matt Ridgway from World War II and Normandy and General James Gavin also from Normandy. All three of these generals spoke out against the Vietnam conflict. General Shoup, who retired in uh, Lyndon Johnson's first year of his presidency, made speeches across the country that it was the, the reasons for going into Vietnam were immoral. The president, both Johnson and Nixon were lying to the American people and that it was going to tear the fabric of our republic apart. So not all of the attacks on presidents have been for political party purposes. Some of them have just simply been assessments. And this is David Shoup. And Shoup's, uh, General Shoup's conduct was of such a nature that he began writing George McGovern's speeches for him uh, during McGovern's attempts to become president. And he would go on the campaign trail in uniform with George McGovern in 1972 and arguing that there was only one thing more dishonest than Lyndon Johnson and that was Richard Nixon. Well, let's wrap this back up and to see what constraints there are statutory constraints on the president. We've talked about civil military relations and how the country survived outspoken generals. Let's take it back to the president. These are the two laws that affect and constrain any president. Uh, for the use of the military domestically, in addition to the Constitution. These laws are rooted in the Constitution. The 1807 Insurrection Act requires the request of a state government, the governor, or the collapse of a state government. Now, Professor Nyberg mentioned five judge advocates coming up with five different opinions. This is my opinion. Because no governor requested President Trump use 
the uh, army or any other active duty military or reserve to police the state. The threat was an empty hollow threat, but if it had been complied with to do so, would have violated the Insurrection Act. Washington DC is different because Washington DC doesn't have a governor. So the DC National Guard that already falls under the president as commander in chief. In theory, President Trump could use and order the DC Guard then to serve as a police force, but not the active duty army. That doesn't stop there because ordering the National Guard to serve as a police force is a different issue altogether than ordering the DC National Guard to fire less than lethal weapons. There's no such thing as a non-lethal weapon, but less than lethal weapons like pepper spray and rubber bullets, which can kill and maim people. Um, that's a different legal question altogether. And a new administration will investigate exactly, I would hope, what was done there. Uh, because I'm not convinced that the Insurrection Act was followed or other restraints on the use of the military, including the Guard in Washington, D.C. Of course, there's the 1878 Posse Comitatus Act, which comes about during President Rutherford Hayes' um, presidency, which is sort of the Insurrection Act on steroids. And it makes it a crime to use the Army or Air Force. Obviously, the Air Force doesn't exist until 1947. In Rutherford Hayes' time, if there was an Air Force, it had a hot air balloon and nothing else uh, to it, right? But it makes it a crime to use the active duty military or the reserves as a police force in the United States. The problem with the 1877 Posse Comitatus Act is no, no one has ever been prosecuted under it. Now, the other issue with both acts is that they're premised on the threat and collapse of the civil government. And the demonstrations for social justice are far less of a danger to the federal government than demonstrate, they're not to overthrow the government, number one. And, and number two, it's not like 1970 with the invasion of Cambodia and buildings being, ROTC buildings being blown up and people lighting themselves on fire outside of the Pentagon. None of that has happened today. Nixon didn't even come close to ordering the military out in 1970. So that these threats are being uh, issued for one or two or more hybrid reasons, but none of them are because of the legality of their use. Um, it, and again, this is my perception and my analysis of it. The threats to use the army as a police force were without constitutional sanction. No one has been ever prosecuted on the other hand. Well, and let me say this, I believe that William Barr Advise, or Attorney General Barr advised the president he could act with impunity. And that's because no one's ever been prosecuted for violating the Posse Comitatus Act. The Posse Comitatus Act does not give a remedy. So people who are arrested by the army are not going to go free. People who've been shot by the army are not going to be able to sue the United States government. They're not going to be able to go to court and stop the army from doing what they're doing under the president's orders because as the Supreme Court cited in both Rosker and Orloff, the judges are not tasked with running the army or the National Guard. If you remember Kent State, individuals tried to sue the governor of Ohio for the misuse of the National Guard after Kent State. And the Supreme Court said, the federal judiciary can take no cognizance of these cases because judges are not tasked with running the army or in that case, the National Guard. So President Trump did as he did, not because he was impulsive, although, that's often the storyline you have it on CNN. I believe it's worse. And I won't impute this to my two guests. I believe it's worse because he was advised he could by people who subscribe to the unitary executive theory. There's an imbalance and there's an imbalance that favors the president over the retired generals who remain subject to the UCMJ. That imbalance is this. President Trump and other civilians are not subject to the UCMJ. So the president acts contrary to the restraints of military law. This inevitably meant that the one agency that could speak out were the retired generals. So who in the government spoke for the constitution when Colin Powell and James Mattis and and uh, Mullen, Admiral Mullen and Admiral McRaven spoke out. And I'm not trying to paint them as heroes and put them as a pedestal. This is just the point. Who in the government spoke for the Constitution? They did. 
And rather than upend civil military relations and act unconstitutionally, I believe what the generals and admirals did, the retired ones, when they spoke was that they assisted in nothing less than the prevention of a constitutional crisis and a step towards autocracy. The generals and admirals have gone through war college. Um, they're very bright. They've sat through lectures like Professor Schneid's and lectures that Professor Nyberg has given. They understand what's at stake. They may not always get it right, but the voice that they spoke with as a unit and unity at that moment helped to avert a constitutional crisis precisely because the active duty generals who are still serving cannot do what they did. And with that, um, we may have time for a couple of questions. If you have them, we're, we're uh, wrapping up. I do, before entertaining any questions, um, I do want to thank Professor Rick Schneid and Professor Mike Nyberg. I also want to thank Tony Anderson and Cheryl Burbank and Sue George for helping set this up. But uh, please do uh, send Professor Schneid and Professor Nyberg your, your thanks. And thank you for joining us this evening. I see one question, and the question is, both Trump and Barr are sowing distrust by mail voting. What happens if he loses and refuses to leave office? Well, the military swears to uphold the Constitution. That's their oath, uh, the officer oath. And, uh, you know, I go back to the Bush versus Gore scenario, and I was on active duty. In fact, I was, um, uh, I was, I remember very, uh, very candid discussions that came from up high in the Pentagon. And the issue was say nothing and do nothing and the Supreme Court will tell you who's president. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, we worry about the president refusing to leave office. But remember, we have nine justices on the Supreme Court. We have US District Court judges. And frankly, we have now, if the election were held tomorrow, I could make a prediction. I won't make a prediction who will win, but if it were held tomorrow, you have polls that are almost uniformly showing who's likely to win. Um, there's another question, and I'll, I'll punt that to uh, both Professor Schneid and Professor Nyberg before I throw in my two cents. What do I feel about the fact that for years, the military is by far and away the most trusted institution in the country, isn't that problematic for democracy? And before having Professor Nyberg, please jump in uh, because you teach the future generals at War College. That is true. Gallup polls for the last 25 years have ranked the military as an institution above nurses and teachers and far above religious figures. Um, I was just gonna so, say above religious figures even. Yeah, especially um, after the Catholic church scandals, I think religious figures kind of went down and, and other faith scandals, but um, please go ahead, Mike. So there, there is a negative way to look at this, which is exactly what I think um, Mr. Carver is trying to identify, that it is problematic for a democracy when your soldiers are uh, the people that you're looking to. Sometimes my students will say, and I think they're right, that some of that admiration comes from um, the fact that the 1% of American society that is in uniform is going out and doing the very unpleasant things that nobody else wants to do. So it's kind of a, you know, go and do this and, and we'll give you 15% off at, at Denny's. Um, so I, I think my students, when, when this discussion comes up with non-military people, what they will say is, uh, we're happy for your admiration, but we would prefer that you take the time to learn more about what it is you, the American people, ask us to do through your representatives. And then, as I said earlier, the other thing that I would point out to this is, I, I don't know this, but I think, actually, I do know this in two cases because I heard them say it, that some of these retired officers did what they did because they didn't want to see that go away, that if American active duty soldiers are deployed to Minneapolis, Chicago, wherever, uh, you risk breaking that trust. And when you do that, of course, you make recruitment a problem, you make all kinds of things a problem. So it, it, there is the principle that's involved to be absolutely sure, but there is also the issue that, that if the American military is the last institution in America seen as being nonpartisan, and given those unbelievably high approval ratings, uh, you wanna be really careful how you use it. Um, so I think most of my students would say that it's a very positive 
thing that the American military is supported by the people. But I do think there is a way, and we've had these discussions in seminar rooms, uh, that you could see a more negative side of this. Professor Schneid, do you... Uh... Well, I mean, I, I think the premise, Mr. Carver's premise is, is correct, uh, especially since uh, uh, I also uh, spend a lot of time in the French Revolution and Napoleon and, and trusting and you know, putting your trust in military leaders or armies of the Republic could be historically problematic. Uh, yeah, but I think as long as, yeah, it can be bad. But, uh, <laughs> as yeah. long as they, but as long as there's an oath to the Constitution and, and, and upholding that oath, uh, uh, it, it can be problematic. It doesn't have to be problematic. I think one of the things we've explored today is is cases where it has been and cases where it hasn't been. So I think it's uh, the answer is yes and no uh, to his question. I, I, you know, uh, another, uh, another thing, if I could just throw, uh, so part of the old Whig fears in the United States in the 18th century, it wasn't really really that there would be a coup. The fear was that the American military would be so nonpartisan, at least this is how it's developed over time, that they would obey almost any order. And you could see this in the way that the um, things like the Jade Helm scandal in Texas under the Obama administration, the fear was that, that in this case, the conspiracy theory was that an evil President Obama would issue orders to a very good military that would have no choice but to obey those orders. So, you know, th that was obviously a conspiracy theory, but it's one that drew the lieutenant governor of Texas in. So th that's another reason why there is, you know, kind of the law and then there is the custom. And I think it's the custom as much as the law that those retired officers were, were worried about. Well, and I'd like to say one other thing uh, to add on to that. And I, I agree with both um, Professor Snyberg and Schneid that it's a double-edged sword to use a military term but I don't think it's particularly healthy that Congress, the judicial branch, which is shocking about how low they've gotten in the public esteem, they used to be much higher, and the executive branch are distrusted. I, I'm happy, and I think people in uniform are happy to be trusted um, because the general public doesn't fear the military kicking their door down at night the way they fear the police perhaps kicking their door down at night. And the military is by far an imperfect institution. And there've been some fairly corrupt individuals in it who are behind bars, both on the uniform side and on the civilian side. Um, but I think it's not healthy for democracy that we are lacking in such trust. And I don't, while there are going to be people who posit, and perhaps they're right that the retired general spoke to uh, protect the institution of the military. I think it's far deeper than that. I, I believe that you know, look, Colin Powell uh, and the others went through war college. Some of them have PhDs. They're steeped in reading lists. You get flooded with reading lists on, on, on US history when you're on active and world history and anthropology, sociology and the law. And I think they had a genuine concern that if the military were going to be used to commit to an unconstitutional act, and I've heard one person, I won't attribute any, I, I won't say their name, but they do have four stars and they're retired and they did speak out. And they said, you know, uh, Josh, in Vietnam, no, it wasn't a declared war, it was unpopular, but we never viewed it as unconstitutional. Some of us just viewed it as dumb and mean spirited and criminal in other ways in hindsight and problematic because it was a war that soaked up the poorest uh, and uh, elements of society and minorities, particularly African-Americans into a conscription program that was uneven. All of that's true, but it wasn't unconstitutional in and of itself. Uh, but what would have happened had the president carried out his orders would have been, and then it wouldn't have just been the military losing trust. It would have been the constitutional erosion, the likes of which we haven't seen in our life or maybe in American history. And so I think it, my own sense is it was deeper than that. And again, I'm not going to lionize uh, Mattis and, at all. I, I have a high regard for Powell, but I think it's, I, I don't want anyone to think I'm putting them on a pedestal. I want them to think about my, my argument on their behalf is that they're serving an important constitutional function.
Um, we have another question. It's how are enlisted personnel expected to distinguish orders from superior officers, including the president from constitutional and constitutional? Well, en enlisted members get hammered harder than officers do for garden variety crimes. And that's a problem in the military. Um, but um, the expectation on enlisted uh, troops in, in this situation is that they'll follow the orders of their officers. The barrier between constitutional, unconstitutional, lawful or unlawful begins and ends with the commanding officer and her or his um, you know, headquarters staff to include their judge advocates. So enlisted members are not excused from wrongdoing, but uh, their orders under the law are presumed to be lawful until they're not. Now that affects officers more. Let me explain one thing why that's important in the military. I, I've been in federal agency meetings outside of the DOD and sometimes what I've seen appalled me because under executive rule number one, an agency head who's relying on the advice of their legal advisor is insulated for criminal wrongdoing. That's right. So if I'm the director of the FAA and I commit an illegal act, but I'm doing it because I'm relying in good faith on what my lawyer told me, I can't be, can, I can't be indicted for it. That's basic rule number 101. Now, if I know it's illegal and I, we're all playing ostrich, that's a different story, but it's hard to prove. That's not the same case in the military. The military has a much tighter requirement in the officer court. Enlisted forces are expected to follow their officers. If they don't, it's a mutiny. And so they're, they're not part of this discussion, not because they're not respected. They are the backbone of the military and I eminently respect them, uh, but uh, I can't include them in this, this, this part of the discussion. Um, one last question, and that is, do we feel that the posse comitatus lacks teeth? Well, if the president follows it, it doesn't lack teeth. <laughs> Uh, but, um, you know, uh, it lacks teeth because it has, an, it has no enforcement quality to it in the sense that it's discretionary in its enforcement. Um, Professor Nyberg, would you like to add to that? So I'm not a lawyer. Uh, the only thing I would say is that, you know, the, the, that all of these things are law, but they also have to be underpinned by a set of understood traditions, a, a set of, of what's not only legal and illegal, but what, what's right and what's wrong, what's ethical and what's not ethical. Uh, those are, the, that's the elbowing over the armrest. And um, we, we're, we've seen it before, we're seeing it now, and we will see it again. Professor Schneider. Yeah. I have nothing to add nor any <laughs> expertise to answer. <laughs> okay. okay, well. Thank you, I, everyone. I think. I think that was our last question. I see we're out of time. So I, I truly want to thank everyone for um, coming tonight. I, uh, I hope this was, um, was meaningful. I hope it, it gave new perspectives and reinforced old perspectives. Or, and of course, you're free to, to disagree um, with anything anybody said. I particularly, again, want to thank Professor Nyberg and Professor Schneid for taking time out of their lives and joining us. They're both on the East Coast, so it's now 9.03. And uh, with that, I'll wish everyone a, uh, a good night. Good night. Thank you, Thank everyone. You.